Hello, I would like to welcome you to our next talk during the autumn season of Chelem Community Lectures. Uh, firstly, I would like to welcome uh, Markus Neustetter and uh, turn into session. Hello. Hi. Hi. Thanks for uh, having us. <laughs> thank you very much for joining us. Uh, well, uh, today, uh, the name of today's uh, lecture is uh, Scratching the Surface. And if you're gonna have any questions during the lecture, you can ask them uh, through the YouTube comments and I'm gonna read them in the end of the talk. So, and because we're very excited about your performance and everything, um, you can start now. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, welcome to everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, we are currently sitting in Johannesburg, South Africa. Um, I introduce you to Stephen Hobbs, my business partner and colleague in the Trinity session. Um, Kira Struick, <laughs> uh, Tammy Stewart over there, and then Pauline Borton, who's joining us on another screen. Uh, let me show her to you. Um, there we go. Pauline is joining us from her home studio and her garden at home. Um, and yeah, we will be taking on a little journey today. The intention is to show you a little bit about our practice to give you an insight into what we do and who we are, um, and then take you on a kind of a, a live journey through our own practices and experiments. Uh, it's gonna be a, a way of trying to break away from the Zoom screen. We're gonna try and do as much as possible as live. So um, bear with us as we move cameras, shift around and take you on a little journey um, through gardens and studios. Um, but I think Stephen's gonna kick us off with a little introduction on who we are and what we do. So I'm going to hand over to you, Stephen. Thanks, Marcus. So, yeah, we've, uh, we, we're happy to report that we turned 20 years this year. We're an artist collective called the Trinity Session that formed in 2001 at a time when it was important to respond to the lack of galleries and museums in Johannesburg and in the country in general. And what we've been, have we got it on the PowerPoint? Um, I think okay, I so let's go there. And to fast forward to maybe 10 years into our practice, um, we learned that there was a strategic way in which we could um, offer our services as artists and curators to the city of Johannesburg in relation to its um, public art programs, which have been running for since 2006. And in the list that you can see there, we are, have been involved in developing art strategies, commissioning pieces of sculpture and performances and implementing them. So we have a lot of experience in working with communities, working in very specific neighborhoods with people with no skills, some skills, people who are afraid of the word art, but have a lot of desire to be creative in their own right. And we found that our, we're best as artists working between the city and the client who wants to change the way we see the city through culture and working with communities to help them understand their, their role and, and the possibilities they can play in that. So the slides at the bottom just give you a very, very brief selection of small, medium scale and large scale sculptures we've produced over the years and some installations that also involve performance and celebration and festival that is very much a part of the way that that particular community practices. So in terms of where we are today and where we are presenting from, we are based at the Orchards Precinct and we're in a facility called the Orchards Project and Orchards refers to a time in Johannesburg nearly over 100 years ago where there was a citrus farm that was planted as part of the, the mining um, economy that was, was emerging in Johannesburg and so our location is very much about um, the natural world. We are surrounded by very beautiful parks, many of which have been upgraded, and we have been uh, very involved in those upgrades. And some of the slides that you see to the right-hand side show you a little bit of our environment outside our building and ways in which we've been working with recycled materials to create landscaping opportunities and possibilities for growing things. Can I just keep prompting? Okay. And this gives you an idea of ways in which we can work with very simple found and cheap materials, working in groups with people from different disciplines. In this particular group, we've got um, a man who is an arborist, a specialist working, uh, a specialist working with trees, uh, the lady in the luminous cap, the, 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 the bright uh, lemon colored cap, 
uh, is one of our community liaisons and an employee of ours who works uh, with a fantastic community in Noordgesig, close to Soweto, the famous township of South Africa or Johannesburg, and a, a number of other practitioners who are uh, fungi specialists and uh, permaculture specialists and people who really understand how important it is to grow things, to provide communities with affordable and sustainable and healthy uh, products. Um, now, to come back to where we are, this is the historical route to Pretoria, which is the capital of South Africa, the, um, uh, the, the political capital of South Africa. And it was founded in the 1850s by Paul Kruger. And this is the route that African tribes from sub-Saharan Africa would have traveled along with their carts and their, and their oxes to trade cattle in Pretoria. This is before Johannesburg was really a mining town proper. And we are based probably 100 meters away from that curve that you see in the, in the image. Now, the next slide shows, brings us up to contemporary uh, Johannesburg, where that route that I was showing you before, that old road, has been upgraded on many occasions, and more recently upgraded to accommodate a bus rapid transit system, a system that complements the buses that already exist in Johannesburg and the taxis and other forms of, of transport throughout the city. And we've worked very closely with the designers of the uh, stations themselves and worked with local artists to produce specific pieces of art that sit on the stations and create an experience as you enter the station, but also the piece of art relates to something that you can see uh, in relation to the, the station and the built environment around it. And part of the work uh, that we've been doing in this area has been to work in different neighborhoods and locations where the city of Johannesburg is investing money into new public facilities. So what you see here is the recently completed Patterson Park social cluster development. In other words, a facility that, can, that has a library, has public open space, has sports facilities, tennis courts, you see the swimming pool in the background there, and a whole range of other offerings for community to feel that have a new destination for leisure, culture, learning, and so on. And our artworks program is situated throughout the building. You can see the, the images on the screen there. And if we take a number of views of the building from different perspectives, you can see how we've integrated artworks throughout the, the new building. And I will conclude with this slide, which comes back to uh, the old citrus farm. So if you have a look at the, the image on the left-hand side, you see the, a drawing of what the upgraded Patterson Park looks like. And here where I have the orange X is where these sculptures sit. And these are very large steel sculptures that commemorate the citrus farm that I mentioned before. But what's also very nice and, an, and another piece of work that we introduced into the park is we found these old fig tree cuttings from a nearby clearing. They had removed them. These are very old trees, about 100 years old. And we spent some time working with local designers and artists to transform them into pieces of furniture that could sit in the park. And here you can sit in almost in a circle and meet and greet and, and, and rest in the, in the shade of the trees and the plants. So this is really the location and the site of Orchards, Orange Grove, Patterson Park was already a, an environment that inspired us to think about nature, to think about growing, to think about what it means to be green and to green things. And I'll leave it there. Thanks very much. Let's stop the share. Excellent. So in, in light of that, I think it's uh, quite appropriate now to maybe show you, kind of zoom into where, where that map show, showed us on the route where we are and um, show you the location in which we're standing and the journey that we're now going about um, creating what, what we create, called uh, Scratching the Surface as an exhibition within this venue um, that incorporated our artistic practices as artists, but also as growers, people that are planting things, growing things, and looking at what it means to be growing and producing at the same time. Now, we know that as part of this, uh, the program and network of, of projects that are happening around the world, it's, it's quite important for us to give you this contextual background that Stephen just gave you to, to position it, but also just to acknowledge that um, 
you know, with with the onset of the lockdown and the, the and the complexities of in the COVID times, and I think the participants that are part of the session today will talk about it. There was a, a shift and a and, and an uptake to ask the question of food security. Now, food security is not just something that came up due due to uh, COVID. It was food security has always been something that's occupied the minds of any third world context um, and any situation where um, you need to basically find your food as a strategy of survival on a daily basis. Um, and so what's been really exciting is to think about this as artists, think about how it is a personal journey that we're encountering as we're going through the making, the growing, and the creating of something new, not quite knowing where it's going to take us, but um, yeah, trusting the journey and the process. So what I think would be quite appropriate now is maybe going around the studio here and showing you one or two moments um, and maybe allowing uh, Kira and Tammy and Pauline um, in their ways to show us a little bit of what they've done and hopefully with that we can then uh, kind of conclude it at the end with some conceptual ideas of where it's going to go next um, and then we'll have chance for a few a bit of Q&A and if you don't have any questions I know we've got a lot for each other so we can have a big discussion on our side because this is a work in progress this is experimental this is a work in process that you have to understand um, is as alien to us as it probably is to you as an audience, because we trust that what we do has meaning as we're doing it. And we're trying to find a um, kind of a galvanizing moment where all these creative voices come together. So let's see if we can try and galvanize some creative moments here. Um, as I said in the beginning, this is a kind of creative lecture where we're trying to break the screen. So we're gonna to switch to another phone now or to another screen now, and we're gonna follow someone around to um, their space and see what uh, they would like to share with us. So I'm going to do a quick technical switch. Who would like to go first? I'll go first. All right. So then let's mute this. Um, all right. All right. All right. All right. Pardon me. All right. Now we should be fine. Um, can I just get an indication if you can hear us? Jeka or Mikhail, can you just let me know that you can yes, hear us? Yes, yes, we hear you. Thank you. Everything is fine. Good, thank you. All right, so do you want to start outside or start inside? Let's start inside. Let's start inside. Introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. I'm Kira. Welcome to my, my micro studio. So as Marcus mentioned, we had quite a strict lockdown in South Africa. Um, which resulted in us not only being forced to work from home and out of our traditional creative spaces, but also really consider the implications of, of food security, of transport networks, and, and of access to the things that you know, many of us take for granted. Uh, and what we did as a, a remedy to this was to start exploring the potential of planting in our own gardens, creating sustainable spaces where we could grow our own food during this process. Uh, for me as an artist, I found this quite challenging. I'm, I'm not naturally a person with green fingers. But what, what did happen, aside from actually learning to grow a few things that, that were edibles, was I, I began a much more intense observation process um, in my natural environment. And I think for me, it created a link between the sort of physical anguish of lockdown and, and the mental anguish that accompanied that and the isolation. Um, but being outside in this garden I was creating, being surrounded by birds led to a kind of exploration process. Um, and, and for me as an artist, that process is both backwards looking and forwards looking. And as someone with dual citizenship, it's also uh, between the North and Southern hemisphere. So what you'll see on the walls is a, a lot of very experimental work relating to the idea of nests and incubation, of creating safe spaces, um, and mitigating our isolation during the times that we've been through recently. But it also touches on ideas of, of exploring, of, of imagining the future um, and putting myself in a situation where if we were to lose the resources that we have, how would we, how would we recreate them? Would we be able to make new worlds on this earth and of this earth? Um, another interest that's started coming through in the physical works, which you'll also see outside in the garden, um, is the idea of building with the resources we have available to us. Um, and there's a cross-connection there between things like the dry-packed stone walls that you'll find in Europe 
but in the, the solid architecture that is particular to Southern Africa. Um, and that's, that's specifically for me what I would call garden architecture, whether that's stone-built kraals or keyhole gardens from the Lesotho region. So as we take you outside to have a look at our space there, you'll also see that we have been experimenting with found materials to build some of this architecture. So if you'll just walk with us outside for a minute. And as you can see, we have lovely weather here at the moment. The speaker. Is the Wi-Fi still okay? Wi-Fi still okay for now? <laughs> Yes. Come and look at an unfinished prototype. Um, I just want to stay on this side. Okay, let's go through yeah. this way. Uh, and it's um, based on the idea of keyhole gardens used quite often in Lesotho on mountainous regions, with the idea that you can build these structures close to close to your home or your dwelling as possible. Um, and all your kitchen waste gets fed into it, and it creates an automatic composting system that feeds down into um, your very small growing section. Yeah, that's you. Okay. So let's go. So we're testing our Wi-Fi to the utmost. <laughs> so this is the prototype of the keyhole garden that we're busy working on. Yeah, so it's it's an unfinished prototype. We're busy packing it, um, and we've created our own compost infill to add to it. But uh, just in terms of using material available, we had a, a previous subcontractor on the site who left behind an uh, incredible amount of concrete blocks which we, we are repurposing for all our sort of structural interventions that are happening in our garden space. And what needs to be maybe mentioned is uh, the space itself um, will lend itself to an incredible performance space, experimental growing space. Um, and it's, uh, as we said, a work in progress. Mm -hmm. Work in progress. And you'll also see across the road, a lot of the inspiration from my nest and bird artworks comes from the park that's over there. Marcus, if you climb up here, you'll be able to see. So um, that is the park that Stephen mentioned earlier that we're working next to and that we're connecting to with various public art projects in that space that then connect back to what we're doing on site here. Thank you, Kira. Thank you. Anything you want to add still? I'm good for now, thanks. You're good for now? All right. So are we going to follow you, Tammy? Sure. There we go. So as you can see on this journey, um, the, the materials that are around are very much found materials from the area, things that we've been collecting and working with, the workshop outcomes, experimental projects that we've been creating with children locally, and the, the boards on the walls are just content of inspiration and notes, et cetera, towards our green project that we're doing. So where would you like to start, outside or inside? What do we think? Maybe start outside and then come in. No, no, start with the drawing. Start with okay. the drawing. Starting okay. Inside. Starting inside with the drawing. Welcome to my office. <laughs> <laughs> Studio. Studio. <laughs> so this is a painting that I've been working on for the past couple of weeks. Um, it's inspired by an emotional mapping exercise that I did. So it started during lockdown, as Kira was speaking about, where we couldn't physically be in the space. So I tried to do a mapping exercise based on my memories. So this is an abstract map of working inside Tipper, working inside the Orchards Project, uh, Patterson Park that Stephen mentioned, Short Brook Park, all the surrounding areas. And I just tried to map my memories and my emotional responses to working on those projects. So some of the colors represent happiness, some sadness, frustration, anger, excitement, all of those sort of emotions. And I just tried to represent it in an abstract way. So, I guess the intention of setting it up like this is that when you step into the space, I sort of want the viewer to be overwhelmed in a good way and in a bad way. And I think that's sort of how we experience emotions and projects. We, we can feel excitement and anger at the same time. And it should inspire a sense of joy and wonder in you. But also, I think if you spend long enough in the space, you can get a bit of a headache and it can overwhelm you a little bit. So. <laughs> to be best of both worlds. Especially if we spin the camera around really fast. <laughs> <laughs> so for all of you viewers there, if you spin the camera around like that, I think you'd get a bit dizzy. <laughs> but this is also a sketch and a prototype to something new. Yeah, so what I've been working on here has actually inspired some of the design work that I've done outside, which I will show you right now. <laughs> So 
so here we're going to the other side of the building now. Um, so Kira was on, on, the, on the other side and now we're in the front section of the building. Yeah, so what we've been doing here is a sensory garden. So as Marcus said, this is the entrance to the building. It's meant to act as the welcoming entrance that invites visitors to come inside, sit down, engage with us. So we built a sensory garden here using some of the materials that were left over, as Kira mentioned at the back. So this structure is built out of uh, pavement cement bricks, which weigh a ton. I got a good workout <laughs> building this thing. So this was left by the local roads agency um, uh, and to, to construct this. So let's just get a big view of it. Uh, these were made using old cement culverts, which we've actually flipped upside down. So they've sealed in at the bottom, and then we've done some brickwork to fill in the sides. And we've chosen all of the plants very specifically to speak to different senses. So some of them feel amazing. You see here we've got this furry aloe. Uh, yeah, this one's a furry one. We've got lots of different textures that I was trying to plant. We've got nice smelling things, herbs and nice tasting things. I planted certain plants to attract bees and insects back into the area. Um, and this mural behind here was a test prototype that we did for the Espen mural that Stephen mentioned. But one of the future plans is to sort of upcycle the mural that I did inside and replicate it out here. And then hopefully once this plant bed grows a bit more, we're gonna make trellises to speak to the mural and integrate the site into one cohesive image, I guess. Brilliant. Yeah, what else can I say? So, so what's, what's exciting about this process is seeing your um, response in the studio, but then also responding to the site and how you've designed this uh, based on the land, the movement of the site. Uh, apparently this specific shape comes from somewhere. Yes, so <laughs> good point, Marcus, thank you. So the mural that I was doing inside with the big circles, I tried to sort of replicate that thinking when I was designing these planter beds. So within this planter, there are some tree stumps that we couldn't remove. So I used those as sort of the starting point to make rings. And then based on the size of these bricks, the rings changed shape a little bit and morphed a little bit. So it's a very site specific structure that could only exist in this space and can't really be replicated anywhere else. Fantastic, thank you. Um, and just for the sake of uh, um, to understand context a little bit, earlier on you saw on the other side the park. On this side, this um, the side of the site links to uh, an ex uh, gallery space over there, and then into suburbia, which is on the other side of that wall, um, with people's homes, gardens, uh, and living quarters. And so, what's really nice is that we kind of tuck between park and suburbia um, and that in itself is an exciting moment because that's also the space in which we hope to inspire people to participate and be, be part of this so i think um for the sake of the wi-fi i'm going to go back inside and then we're going to connect to pauline um pauline are you ready for us let's uh let me first get to the computer pauline and then you can connect sure as we're walking through the space you can see it's starting to get a bit darker today and on our side um obviously Sun is setting soon. Let me find Pauline here. Um, all right, Pauline, I'm going to switch to you. Sure. Can you hear me nicely? Um, okay. so, so my, uh, my space, I'm inviting you into my home this evening. Um, and what you see in front of you is, is a representation of my home itself. And then the garden is represented in these, these beautiful pot plants I have resting on my dining room table. Um, I've been collecting notes this evening from, from this lecture and I'm imagining that they're the bricks and the mortar that are holding up parts of my garden walls around my house. Um, my particular project is part of what we're calling the micro home garden project for the green project that we're working on. And days before we went into a very severe lockdown here in South Africa, I went shopping, as did many people, to go and stock up on food. And there were no fresh vegetables or fruits to be seen where I went shopping. 
And that really gave me a fright. Um, and, and I didn't quite know what to do. And I felt very powerless in that situation. So what I did do is the day before our lockdown actually started officially as I went and I bought myself some pot plants, some soil and some seeds. Um, and that's where my sort of my, my, my journey starts, the growing journey starts. Um, my faith, my, I, what I did is I poured my feelings related to COVID isolation and access to fresh food into dreaming about um, a new type of garden space that would sustain me and my family in the future. Um, so during this time, I designed, I drew, and then I also reconnected with memories around my house and, and where I live, which is a very special and safe space for me. But of course, um, being forced into a lockdown also made it a space of isolation and almost, I suppose, being trapped in one space um, and feeling quite powerless. So to be able to dream about a different future was very important to me and part of my creative process. Um, over time, I experimented with growing with vegetables from vegetables. I also grew in pots, as you see in front of you, which still exists today. And then eventually I took my planting out into the garden and started and had a very successful harvest and yield in January 2021. Um, through this process, I felt that I empowered myself and I've now got more confidence this year to share that knowledge with other people as we move forward with our garden project. I think the most important things about this kind of project is that I'm able to learn from them. I'm able to share my knowledge. I'm able to sustain, feed and nourish myself and those around me. Um, and that my garden became a source of therapy. Um, and, and that's really my story. <laughs> Thanks, thanks, Pauline. I think for, for, the sake of, for the sake of what we can see there, is there, is there any way that you can lift your computer so we can see the table from the other side? Because what yes. I would like to ask everyone is that Pauline's incredible activities have been in mapping and, and note-taking in the process and holding on to a lot of content that has generated both as a, um, an, an art, artistic process, you know, the way you do it, you, you capture the information and then you map it and you redraw it and you, you create little... Um, as, you, as, we, as we see the little flags and information um, display systems, so to speak. But at the same time, I think you're, you, you then distill the information and actually create beautiful summaries of it. And I almost see your interconnected notes very much like the plants that you're growing. A um, lot of little experiments that pop up everywhere and then at some point become a forest of information, which is what we are currently sitting in on this side at the Tipper space, as you all saw before walking through notes and maps etc all around it which is a beautiful summary of your journey so oh that's a nice view thank you plant in the foreground and uh, journey in the background <laughs> yes very nice so i think what, what might be quite nice to show is while i'm holding this other camera we'll just leave the um we'll just add another spotlight um so so as i was mentioning just now this this, this incredible amount of information that you see all over the walls here um, mapped around is all part of Pauline's um, process and, and distillation of the information. Um, forgive me, I'm just going to quickly change direction. I can't, I'm using both hands. I could use a hand. <laughs> um, all right, there we go. So, so um, okay. so what, what you see here is, is uh, much of the research, the production, the experimentation from mixing one's own things to uh, um, what, what one can do with the natural resources around us, um, ideas around how to map these spaces. I just thought I'm using that audio. Um, Pauline, uh, just, I'm just taking the liberty of walking into this experimental space of yours where you're showcasing some of your maps, some of your drawings, some of your process that links to what you were saying. Um, so not only about note-taking, but actually copious amounts of drawings and experimental drawings that uh, talk about everything from networks uh, to textures to mind maps, etc. So I'm summarizing horribly now, but I think it's just a beautiful moment to be able to show everyone a little bit of your headspace in the studio over here. So thank you for sharing your journey with us, Pauline.
Thank you very yeah. much, Marcus, for connecting the two. I think that's important, is, is yeah. that I do work in both spaces and they, 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 they equally inspire me at the same time. And then similarly, um, to, to just acknowledge Lavinia and uh, Pauline, you, you, you're obviously very familiar with the work. If you feel like saying something to what I'm showing here right now, I just think it's really beautiful to, to express some of the other mediums that we're experimenting with and the, and the work that's, that's being done from model building and asking questions around how we can build uh, rooftop gardens um, on top of existing houses, for example, and what it would be like to find alternative ways of mapping one's, one's different ideas through um, the material that's available around us. In this case, it was mud, which was in Lavinia's backyard. Pauline, is there something you'd like to add to that? I, I think what's really interesting about the, the mud sculpture that you are, are showing there is it's, it's very representative of a dream that Lavinia has for working with her community in the future and networking across her community, which is a township that sits just outside of Soweto in Johannesburg. And what she's done here is she's investigating the different types of capital that um, exist over and above just monetary, just the financial. So this is a beautiful representation of that um, using local resources, like Marcus has said. Super, thank you. So I okay. think Thanks, Pauline. What I'm going to do is I'm going to switch back to, to, to the collective here. Um, Stephen, do you want to join us here too? Uh, let's just spotlight this video. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> so um, Pauline is still with us. She's just not on the screen with us right now. But uh, I think this would be a really nice opportunity for us to maybe collectively just reflect on um, what we've shown you and the journeys we've taken you on and what we think the next steps might be. Uh, we always ask ourselves that question and um, maybe what it's given rise to in terms of our vision for the way forward and um, maybe plant that seed in your mind and uh, see whether you then have any questions and comments on what you think. We've got uh, another uh, 25 minutes until the end of the lecture or the session. So I think we'll spend a few minutes talking amongst ourselves and then open it up to questions. So Stephen, from this experience, do you want to add anything that um, yeah. summarizes something? Yeah. yeah. So I think um, we've we've spoken we've spoken we've referred a lot to um, the fact that we like to work, or as a consequence of some of our project work, we find ourselves in neighbourhoods um, developing pieces of public art and things like that, and. We've referred to Lavinia and just recently talking about this beautiful little sculpture that she made using sand and mud. So Lavinia is a really important example of relationship building that we've learned about through art projects. So this Patterson Park site is, is one of many sites we've been working on for the past five years, commissioned by the city of Johannesburg. And some neighborhoods are easier to work with in terms of how communities uh, coexist and, and what, it, what is involved in coming into the communities and building trust and building new relationships and so forth in order to make the project start and continue over a three, four, five year, five year period. And as I mentioned before, we use artistic processes as the language system for communicating with people who sometimes don't think of themselves as artists, but have an absolute desire to be creative, or maybe don't even see their creativity as creativity, but it influences other people around them. It, is, it brings about change, it introduces positivity, it makes people think differently in, uh, about their environment and so forth. So for us, the, our greening work, our growing projects are a, a kind of a yin and yang relationship. There are communities, there's the growing project, and in terms of Johannesburg, we are using communities and greening projects for, for understanding new cultural ecosystems. How can we collaborate in new and interesting ways after the city has spent its money on these new developments? What happens next? What happens for the community who uh, gets that new library or public space? What is the program that they can imagine in terms of new activities uh, that could be introduced into that uh, uh, facility. In other words, how do they own it socially, intellectually, uh, in terms of imagining new possibilities for it and so on. So as much as the green work 
has come out of an urgency that we that we experienced during COVID, and there's a lot of knowledge and learning and sharing all the time. We see this, and it's not unusual, we see this as an extended social project. So if we can understand how to grow something on our windowsill or the balcony of our flat, uh, wherever we live, and then we can learn from someone else's allotment, which is maybe two by two meters, and then we come to a park like the ones we've shown you outside. There are all of these uh, different scales at which we can all participate in growing something, looking after that thing while it is growing, realizing that we're not only the most important thing on the planet, but that the things that grow around us are actually the things that we should be looking after that feed us and nurture us, provide oxygen for us, provide food and all these kinds of things. So, yes, we make public art, but really what we're interested in is a very, very big research project that comes from getting to know people better through creative processes. And growing is that one creative process that we're currently exploring. And of course, growing is a, is a, is a word that we can use in lots of different exactly. ways. We could be growing our children, <laughs> we could be growing vegetables, we could be growing drawings, we could be, <laughs> we could be growing new knowledge. And I, I do want to say something else very quickly. Um, Tammy and Chiara, for example, have been working with us for quite some time now. They both have degrees in art, but they also have frustrations around what the art world can and cannot offer them in terms of a creativity that they want to explore. And so it's a real privilege to us um, to be able to share our experiences in relation to a student body and any of the other um, viewers um, paying attention here, because and I would speak for myself and Marcus, we have careers that are over 20 years now, but um, we are constantly learning and learning from younger artists who have aspirations to work in a traditional art world, but also to understand that artistic and creative practice is not only the property of the art world. We can, we can imagine new economies and new modes of trade and bartering and so forth that go way beyond what the art world has to offer. So growing is really a very powerful um, uh, piece of language for us to imagine how if we work together, how if we support each other, how working across generations and particularly with young people can bring about a tremendous amount of new knowledge, but mostly recreating communities uh, in new and interesting ways. And I th I'd, I'd like to add that I think in the context of Johannesburg and um, South Africa and so many other contexts, especially in the current climate, um, it's essential to be thinking that way, that the art economy as we know it is of a particular type and the cross-disciplinary experimental work that one needs to do to find new um, ecosystems for developing a new arts economy of sorts that doesn't only root itself in what was, but something that is going to come in the future is what's quite exciting. And that's why we keep on referring to this as just scratching the surface, just starting to understand what it is that we're actually doing. And we're hoping that maybe uh, your reflections on this could um, help shape it further. So I think let's hand over the microphone unless you want to add something for just, now. Just to add on the point of, Come of, closer to the of knowledge growth. I think, um, I think I can speak for, for Tammy as well. We, we sort of had this self-imposed um, specification to learn new skills. Mm -hmm. And being in isolation, we obviously all had to do that on our own. And for me, what was so interesting was when we were able to get back together, to come together in the space and share the skills that we'd learned with each other um, and, and be able to, to use new languages, to, to transfer that between ourselves and hopefully going forward to, to the broader community. Um, and I think it's, it, that process has also given us a, a much stronger understanding of how we can collaborate on projects going forward, whether they're greening projects or creative projects, um, and I think the same is for both of us coming from, from academic backgrounds to be given an opportunity um, to, to translate the skills that we have and to share them outside of something that's, that's sort of quite elitist and exclusive. You know, we have, we have knowledge um, and we have knowledge that should be broader based within our communities. And, and for me, that's, you know, one of the biggest opportunities we have with, with what we're doing in this space. Thank you. Um, Fanny, are you right? Do you want to yeah, Fine. Couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> cool. um, so, Pauline, if you want to add something, otherwise I'll hand over to questions. Hand over to questions. Good. Um, so, uh, yeah, how do we do this? Okay, I'm back. 
Unfortunately, no. we don't have any questions uh, from the students. They, they are probably too shy to ask. <laughs> no but, but I have a question about uh, your project, uh, Marcus. Uh, are you working right now on some art project? You can well, share Well, this is, oh, because I didn't show anything and ordered Stephen. <laughs> yeah. Well, I would like you to think of this project as being the art project, yeah? Um, I'd, I'd like to say that this is probably the process that we're all going through right now. Um, this is a collective exercise and, and the room that you see and the experience we took you through is the project, you know, it, it is the, the, the space. And I think that's what's so exciting about this way of practicing is that it's not about identifying only the drawing. I can show you many drawings if you'd like to see some. I don't have them here right now, but I can show you. <laughs> but it's not about that. It's about understanding the connectedness of the different ideas and that network and connecting that network of ideas and actions and uh, processes is what in my mind, a contemporary project is about. So the Trinity session in its own right, as Stephen and I do it as artists, is in itself an art project. And I think that is, that is the difference maybe between identifying something that is finite and defined and clear as a project versus something that constantly grows and evolves and adapts itself to the context, to the time, et cetera. That we're treating it as a project in its own right. And therefore we are able to be quite malleable with it and quite um, adaptive with it. And so um, I wouldn't want to show you anything that is more precise than that, because I think, I hope that in your mind, you can connect the dots and, <laughs> and see this as a whole. Do you not agree? <laughs> well, I mean, in his defense, and he has only been in Johannesburg for the past 10 days, but in that time, he has just produced a solo exhibition, which opened on Saturday. <laughs> and perhaps not in his defense, that particular body of work is about outer space and in interstellar conditions and less about growing. But the principle behind the project still has the same ambitions, I yeah. think. And yeah, it's, it about, it's about how, how one can work as an artist in terms of a bigger field of knowledge, a bigger field of expertise, working between art, science, technology, environmentalism. And all of those issues are in his exhibition, which is running until January next year. So the best thing for you to do would be to go to the mixed reality workshop site and see his exhibition. I can, I can share, I can share, I can share some things with you afterwards if you'd like to share with the students. Great. It wasn't what this uh, talk was about, yeah. but um, essentially Stephen is right. I think the principle of the matter, and the same goes for your work actually. I think we both as artists um, tackle something bigger than just um, the surface that we're working on. I think yeah. it's about an aspiration, a question, a constant questioning of our context, our relationship to the context. And, and I, I think it's about creating that space for others to read into something into it. So while my work is much about looking into space and understanding the unknown, well, not understanding it, but trying to make sense of the unknown and uh, trying to communicate with it, um, yeah, es essentially this is what this whole um, scratching the surface project is about. But and I would say this weekend, and I unfortunately missed Marcus's exhibition because I was in Dubai giving a, a presentation in the, in, the, with the, in the context of the Dubai Expo. It was their Cultures in Conversations program. And the part that I contributed to was rural and urban development. And essentially I was sharing this work in the Middle East over the weekend. And I think we, I, I mean, I said it, we said it earlier, but to, we are very grateful for the connection that has been made between yourselves and Marcus based in Vienna and connecting back to us because the power of that, the, the power of the intention of the connection, we are aware that you are, this, this is a network of tertiary institutions or higher learning institutions. So even at the virtual level, we're still growing. And that's really the powerful thing because it's in the entire process of survival is about strategic mechanisms of social networking that use culture as the tool to create spaces of, of safe conflict, of safe questioning, of safe debate, but that can produce new solutions and new ideas. Well, thank you very much. I have also one question. I would like to ask you for, uh, um, I would say, uh, educational aspects of your uh, project because uh, you already mentioned a lot of scales 
Uh, you are working with the community, participatory project, environmental stuff, uh, 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 very complex work. Uh, and how you feel, uh, how, how you think about the position of educational uh, aspects uh, as a part of your role? Uh, because I, I think it is one of the crucial points. Because you already mentioned that one of, of your goal is to educate in, uh, for example, in, in um, uh, aspects of environmental or community uh, responsibility and so on. So could you a little bit in detail uh, 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 describe your uh, educational uh, strategies? Well, I, I want to, before we talk about the actual strategies of, to this project, I think it's important to acknowledge that the Trinity session has always been about um, not only educating itself, <laughs> but um, uh, developing audiences. I think it's very important to understand the context in which we're in. Um, you don't have people standing in queues to go to, into the museum. You know, the, the notion of arts and culture is a very different one to, for example, Central Europe. And so from the beginning as artists, you ask yourself the critical question that if I don't educate my peers and my network and at the same time develop new audiences, I'm going to just be talking to the same people over and over again, and it's not going to perpetuate any change. And so um, one of the key aspects has always been to think about how do we not only build a community of practice and an educational component that's very important because you're constantly skill sharing, passing on your information, et cetera, but how do you also um, enable the people that are going to witness what you're doing? How do you enable the, 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 the audience that's coming in? And very often it takes different tools. And I mean, growing is, is going to be another one of those tools and is another one of those tools because um, food concerns us. Uh, growing something is an amazing concept. Uh, when, once you do it once, you, you, you start to understand the circle of, cycle of life and you understand what it means to be part of that community. And, and, and so we are generating in our practice all the time an audience that we can then present ourselves to and continue the dialogue with and hopefully build the network further. So that's on a much more larger scale um, that everything that we do has that component in it. Um, we have very practical skill sharing processes where we've got different people in the team that have different skills. So there's a constant exchange, which we're monitoring, which we um, engage in, which we map on all of these maps behind us to say, this is how we're learning from each other. These are the histories that we all bring to the project and how we exchange it. So there's internal education, which is very, very important for all of us. Um, and then there's the obvious part, which is um, how can we sustain a practice here um, without actually thinking about the future generation that's going to enter this world. So um, children, the youth, um, neighbors, uh, people that need to learn about what we do will actually can learn about it by physically coming in and doing workshops, uh, doing, doing proper programs, uh, joining in different sessions. So that's part of the vision that we've got in this space. We have prototyped it. It has been very interesting to do. Obviously, COVID regulations has made it very difficult to do this on, on a particular level uh, physically. But there have been various virtual um, projects where we've looked at cultural ecosystems and partnerships through educational programs that we've done virtually. Um, and there, very specifically, it was about identifying, identifying key communities, going into those communities and saying, how can we together co-produce something? And in that co-production, educate each other about our skills exchange and educate each other about how to do something. And I think the notion of co-production and being part of a community is very, very important in that, uh, in that case. But I think over and above that, we obviously have plans of, um, uh, Tammy's nodding because she's busy working on a little syllabus of sorts. If you want to share anything on, on those ideas for the future. Um, maybe just for a more concrete example that I can give you. So one of our other team members who's not here at the moment, Paul Satate, who's a very skilled welder and fabricator. This is just an example for our internal sort of skill sharing program. So I want to learn welding skills from him and he wants to learn fine arts painting skills from me. So we're setting up an exchange between us two where I'll set up workshops, teach him about art theory, art painting techniques, and then in exchange, he'll teach me about welding. And yeah, that sort of art syllabus that I'm creating will be offered to the rest of the supporting team, I guess, our, like our workshop manager here and Lavinia in Norfusser, who is a skilled painter, but doesn't necessarily have the, the fine arts techniques, so. And, and similarly, that's gonna tap into the gardening aspect. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> but, but I actually want to add another point. I mean, at a, at a pedagogical level, there, we have some very interesting partnerships with um, preschools, primary schools, and even secondary schools. And the, the, 
we're, we're actively very involved in, in co-writing um, a white paper that we hope will shift urban, urban implementation and urban framework policy where we start with the, with the mind and the eye of the child, that it is essential that we start thinking about designing our cities um, through, through, through active citizenry that we see in children, that children, babies are born citizens. It's not like they become a citizen later. So we need to think pedagogically in, in, in the actual application of projects, how, how that actually works. So in some instances, one would say that, in fact, in all of our work, where we have the freedom to do it, we would take a curiosity-led approach. So instead of taking an outcomes-based approach, we facilitate based on the particular interest and inquiry of an individual, and then provide the resources to facilitate that. So from an educational point of view, you are actually really thinking about people as individuals as opposed to a curriculum that prescribes the learning outcome. Does that answer your question somewhat? Yes, thank you. <laughs> and one more question. Yes. Uh, I am really impressed uh, by uh, your, um, I would say, uh, power to attract the local authorities because you did a lot of, uh, I would say, really huge uh, public artworks in cooperation with the local authorities. Could you explain a little bit your strategy how to attract them. Uh, how much time do we have? <laughs> but I think, I, I mean, I think the reason why the, the big projects that you see now, and indeed we, we were very lucky, we started making big projects almost 20 years ago. But Johannesburg, on the one hand, Johannesburg is a big city. If you include the townships, you would be talking 13, 14 million people. But Johannesburg as a city is really quite a small city of like I suppose uh, in some networks within New York or London. Eventually you get to know who are the decision makers be it at city level, at academic level, uh, in museum and cultural institutions and so on. So if you stick around in a place long enough and you prove that you know how to do the job over and over again, really it's a question of determination and being present and, and learning from every single project. And our projects um, within the city, and as I said earlier, making pieces of public art is a way of making money from a business point of view for us. But actually, if you want to change the world around you, you need to get as close to the decision makers and the policy makers as, 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 as fast as you possibly can. And this requires being charming. It requires offering information that is of, of use to the authorities and actually educating the authorities because just because city managers have these master plans and urban design frameworks that they've gone through a rigorous process of, of uh, developing and signing off and implementing, they are not the ones that actually do the work. They have written the policy and they have done the intellectual work and they've done a 10 year, 15 year, 20, 30, 40 year projection for what the city may be. But it is, the designers, the architects, the quantity surveyors, the engineers, the, the, the project managers, the community liaison officers, the residents, the taxpayers, they are the people doing the work. So to the point about scale, this is very important to understand if you imagine your practice as an artist, not just being about the museum or, or the gallery, but that you are the medium. And then it's a question of understanding when is the right time to wear a suit and tie, when is the right time to wear your ber beret and your smock? <laughs> and, you, and you perform your way through based on what people need to hear and want to hear. Yeah. But then you better deliver the goods. <laughs> yeah. I think but, but I was going to add to that is um, obviously one, one needs to also build case studies for oneself. So, so a lot of our early projects were also us just doing the work, even without the contracts, even without the relationship to the city. It was about going into that public arena, producing what we have to produce in order for us to make sense of it, doing the research as artists. So in our own practices, spending more and more time um, making sense of that space and, and then internalizing it and actually producing something so we can actually step to the plate and say, we've shown that it can be done. We've presented some ideas and some options. They might have worked, they might have not worked, but at least there's something to talk about. Uh, the worst case scenario is, is presenting a th theoretical slide to 
to a politician or to someone with, that works in the city with a whole lot of words on it and no pictures. And the pictures have to be of their own neighborhood with their community and, and their language. And then suddenly something happens in the brain that goes, oh, wait a minute. If they can do it, maybe with a little bit of support, they could help my next cause. And then one adapts according to the cause that, that the politician sometimes needs. Um, and, and so in that way, I think while Stephen's right, he's saying, you know, you need, to, you need to, it's a performance, but as you, the last point is that you actually have to show the goods. And sometimes we have to take the leap of faith as artists to produce before we get paid, you know, to, to actually deliver because you're interested in delivering and convincing people with the product that you present. Um, and then that has, has a knock-on effect. So that brings us back to this exhibition and this process we're doing right now is we're trying exactly that. We're trying to produce as a group. We're trying to produce something creative, experimental and all the rest of it. And we're hoping that we're enticing you in the same way as we are going to be enticing our neighbors to continue this dialogue and be part of this network and, and, invest. and, and invest in one form or another, be it physically or, or um, intellectually or um, in co-production. So I think this is a beautiful example of, of, of how one creates in order to convince. <laughs> Thank you. So maybe, Christina, do you have more questions? I don't, actually. And we have to finish in three minutes. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you very much. It was great. It was a great experience to be there with you. I would love to be there like two more hours and also visit you. Don't worry, Christina, because during the summer semester, I'm sure that we will meet each other online, hopefully, hopefully also physically. Uh, uh, so you will have a chance to, to think about questions uh, for next lecture during, uh, during summer semester. Great, great. I'm very excited. Uh, also, I want, wanted to uh, say, well, thank you all for showing your space and your projects. And to our students, I would like to say that next week we're not gonna have lecture because it's gonna be 32 years after the Velvet Revolution. So we're gonna celebrate freedom in our country. So we are gonna see each other in uh, two weeks. And uh, our next guests are gonna be architects uh, from New York studio. Well, thank you very much and have a nice evening. Thank you very much for having us. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye bye. Ciao. Ciao. Okay, I stopped the stream. Bye -bye.